Good evening, everyone. Welcome to our last Ask the Doctor session for 2020. My name is Shelly Curian with SkyPass Foundation. Thank you guys for taking the time to join us tonight. We've got folks joining us from all over the country tonight. So a very warm welcome to all of you. For those of you who are not familiar with SkyPass Foundation, we are a nonprofit based in Dallas, Texas. And a part of our mission is to serve the Parkinson's community specifically by providing educational resources. So we started this webinar series back in April and we have been fortunate enough to have some of the world's leading experts on our panel to speak to us on various topics pertaining to Parkinson's. And tonight I am honored to welcome our very own Dr. Shilpa Chitnis. Dr. Chitnis sits on our board of directors here at SkyPass Foundation and she is a movement disorder specialist and professor of neurology at UT Southwestern. And she is a big part of everything that we do for the Parkinson's community. So Dr. Chitnis, thank you for being here. We're excited to hear from you. Our session tonight is actually going to look a little bit different for those of you guys who join us on a regular basis. Typically, we do this interview style with Dr. Chitnis asking questions um, of our featured speaker on the, the specific topic that we have for that evening. But tonight, Dr. Chitnis is our featured speaker. So she's gonna be presenting on the topic of the do's and don'ts of Parkinson's disease. And with that, Shilpa, it's all you. Well, thank you, Shelly, for your kind introduction. And I have to also add in a plug for Shelly. Uh, I couldn't do anything that I do without um, Shelly's uh, work, not only is she very efficient and competent, but she also, you know, keeps me in line. So uh, I think it's a team effort. So really um, happy to be here. And, you know, I have a lot of slides, but I'm not going to go through all of all the slides. And I still, you know, want to um, make it a little bit interactive. The topic of taking care of Parkinson's disease is such a uh, you know, such a wide topic that we can talk hours and hours and still have stuff, you know, left to do. So just really quickly, um, want to make sure this moves. So everybody knows this, but just uh, uh, an introduction going into what we're going to talk about. As you know, uh, you know, um, Parkinson's disease was basically described by James Parkinson in 1718 and is a physician uh, out of London. And, and uh, you know, people who join these webinars and, uh, and are knowledgeable know that he didn't actually see all the patients that, um, that he described in this uh, seminal essay that he wrote on the shaking palsy, but he actually saw some people from his balcony in London and then described them. And many, many years later, this is another famous neurologist called Jean uh, uh, Martin Sharko, who basically coined the name Parkinson's disease and then, you know, just another gentleman called George Kotsius, who really was the person who conducted the uh, early studies using levodopa. And that led to the approval of uh, levodopa, carbidopa, or cinemat as the, you know, gold standard for treatment of Parkinson's disease. And we know that this disease affects about one to 2% of the population above the age of 60 years. So if somebody asks me, what is the, can you tell me the one thing that's a risk factor, that's a definitive risk factor for getting Parkinson's disease. And I'll basically say that it's definitely uh, older age. And it's, you know, um, not that um, we see a lot of young onset Parkinson's patients now, and I don't know whether it is that our environment has gotten so bad, or is it that our ability to diagnose Parkinson's disease in patients has gotten better? But you know, generally rare, rarer before the age of 50. But I can't say that because I see a lot of people, you know, that are in their 40s, uh, in, in the 50s, and then the, uh, you know, uh, the lifetime risk is about two per hundred for um, men, and it is about 1.3 per hundred for for women. So, having said that, I'm quickly going to jump into. I'm trying to move this so I can read what I am talking about. So just to you know quickly some risk factors, right? So I talked about age, that's a definitive risk, risk factor. So, you know, if there is a way that we can prevent aging, then that would be helpful. But um, we do know that, you know, insecticides and pesticides, there is a ton of epidemiological data that basically talks about pesticides. But as I tell, you know, my, my trainees or as I tell even my patients is if you were to put, you know, a thousand people in a 
uh, room and were to fumigate that room with basically a known pesticide, would everybody end up getting Parkinson's disease? And what's the answer? Well, the answer is no, because uh, you know some people have an inherent susceptibility for the toxic molecules to be able to cross the blood-brain barrier and get in there and start slowly destroying the cells that basically make you know dopamine. Uh, but then some people uh, may, may not have that um, inherent susceptibility. So everybody obviously won't end up getting that. But, but certainly, you know, I always ask patients, you know, did you grow up on a farm? You know, did you grow up where people sprayed pesticides? Um, you know, traumatic brain injury, TBI, that's one thing that shearing force uh, causing injury to substantia nigra certainly can, uh, you know, or the nigro striatal projections. So from the, the, the projections th that go from, uh, you know, the part of the brain that's called the substantia nigra to the part of the brain where dopamine is released called the striatum, anywhere in that pathway, if there is shearing injury, then it's possible, uh, you know, that people can develop Parkinsonian features. But what protects against developing Parkinson's disease uh, and again, this is all epidemiological data looking at retrospective, you know, reviews of things is, um, you know, people who drink a lot of caffeine and I just happened to drink a, a lot of caffeine. I started drinking caffeine at the age of 16 years at which point I didn't knew nothing about Parkinson's disease, but hopefully I've drunk enough caffeine maybe, you know, for it to be neuroprotective, I don't know. Um, smokers, so they looked at people you know, that had Parkinson's versus people that didn't have Parkinson's. And what they found is that, you know, uh, in those people that smoked, maybe the, uh, the, the, the prevalence uh, was not as much as people, you know, that didn't smoke. Or was it that the Parkinsonian personality was such that it didn't, you know, allow people to basically, uh, you know, smoke uh, and, and hence uh, lost the protection. Um, I do not encourage for anybody to start smoking as a way to not develop Parkinson's disease. Once you develop Parkinson's disease, if you start smoking, that does not protect you in any shape or form. So that's not something we want to do. And then, you know, um, there's this weak data on um, ibuprofen and, and calcium channel blockers, uh, et cetera. So what should you do? You should drink caffeine. What should you do? You should definitely exercise, right? Uh, exercise could be neuroprotective. There is some data that suggests that basically in, uh, you know, this is very interesting uh, data that had come out like in 2002 when I was a fellow where they took these uh, rats and they, you know, uh, put half of the rats on, on couches. So they were couch potatoes and they put ha half of the rats on a treadmill. And then what they did is they gave, gave these people before that, they gave a known toxin uh, that is, that's called 6-hydroxy uh, dopamine. And then when they sacrificed these, you know, mice, not rats, mice, uh, what they found is that the mice that were on the treadmill and were exercising actually had retained, you know, some of the, of, of the dopamine producing cells, as opposed to those that were couch potatoes, were more susceptible to the, uh, to the, you know, toxic effects of 6-hydroxy dopamine and ended up developing Parkinson's disease. So bottom line, exercise always. And Dr. Mike will also support that. So I just wanted to say that, you know, uh, I don't, when people ask me what causes Parkinson's disease, generally what we basically say is that, you know, it's probably a combination of, you know, genetic susceptibility to environmental toxins. Uh, and then of course, you know, now uh, as we have gotten more molecular, you know, when I was in training, we used to tell people, um, you know, Parkinson's disease is not inherited, don't worry about it. But I think that, you know, there are genetic forms of Parkinsonism, you know, are they the same as garden variety Parkinson's disease? Because some of these, you know, pathologically do not look like Parkinson's disease. And so I think that, you know, there is, um, you know, certain percentage of Parkinsonism that is now genetic. And so the common, you know, genes, uh, you know, alpha synuclein, Parkin, you know, LARP2, um, and then of course, you know, so LARP2, one of the Google founders, his mother has Parkinson's and he has a LARP2 mutation. That doesn't mean that he will definitely get Parkinson's disease, but that definitely puts him at a higher risk of developing it as opposed to somebody that doesn't have the gene. And last but not the least is a gene that's called GBA or, you know, glucocerebrosidase, which is a gene that's implicated in 
uh, you know, a metabolic condition called Gaucher's disease, and those things can certainly put you at, at risk for developing them. So, you know, in my world, we say genetics loads the guns and environment pulls the trigger. And this is probably, and in, and in addition to genetics, this is probably as good an explanation as I'm going to be able to give you. And so, uh, you know, avoid as much as possible chemical pesticide exposure, and, you know, if possible, choose your parents wisely. And then this is just, uh, you know, a cartoon that I found that I thought was very funny. And it's a patient that's talking about weight gain. Um, and that's very interesting. Okay, so very quickly, you know, before we go to some do's and don'ts, what happens in Parkinson's disease? So, you know, <clears throat> I, I put the, this monster as a, as a unknown, representative, you know, what is it? Is, that, is it some infection? Is it some environmental toxin? Is it some chemical that causes inflammation? And essentially what happens is, this is the protein that is alpha-synuclein, which is implicated in the pathogenesis of Parkinson's disease. And so alpha-synuclein is a fiber, like, you know, monofilament by itself. And what now happens is, you know, whatever it is, you know, whatever the the trigger might be insecticides, pesticides, you know, oxidative stress, um, inflammation that basically causes, excuse me, a misfolded protein. And then, uh, and then of course, genetic predisposition being another one. And suddenly what happens is this single stranded alpha-synuclein now becomes, you know, a couple of different strands and it's misfolded. And these are different, you know, configurations of protein that it goes through. And then, these things are called fibrils. And they, what happens is that there's also the body's, uh, you know, clearing mechanism that would otherwise clear these abnormally folded protein is also affected in patients with Parkinson's disease. And therefore these toxic proteins are not able to be cleared out. And what ends up happening is the cell dies. So the cells that make dopamine die. And then, you know, the cells that do not die will show uh, a pathological structure, as we all know, that's basically Lewy body. And one of the composition of Lewy body is this misfolded, you know, alpha synuclein. So, so this is, you know, this is basically a um, dopaminergic neuron. Uh, this dark substance here is, you know, it's, it's neuromelanin. And that's why, you know, that, that part of the brain where Parkinson stems from is called substantia nigra or dark substance. And that's because of neuromelanin. And this is a neuron that, you know, um, that did not die, but essentially survived. So the, the neurons that die, die, and you lose dopamine, but the ones that do not die manifest the pathological hallmark of Parkinson's disease, which is this dark pink structure surrounded by a lighter pink halo. And that's basically called Lewy body. And so, um, and then if you look at, you know, a brain of, a normal person, and this part is really the substantia nigra, you see the dark substance that's stained, and then you basically see this pale area because you've lost the, you know, uh, the neurons that make dopamine and hence you lost the neuromelanin. And thereby, what ends up happening is you get these, you know, symptoms. So you basically get, you know, a stiffness or rigidity. Uh, you get, you know, you can get a shuffling gait, you can get slowness of movement, and then you can get tremor. And you know, interestingly enough, up to 30% 30 of patients may not have a tremor. And a lot of times patients do not come to see a physician, uh, although, you know, they, they, they may, their hand may not be functioning or their shoulder is hurting and they're not uh, moving their arm or they're not walking well. And a lot of patients say, this can be Parkinson's disease. I don't have a tremor. And so many, many, many years, I mean, I've had anywhere between one to three to four years where patients basically, you know, go about trying to figure out, you know, what is going on uh, just and not, uh, not present to, to the doctor for, for that reason. So I'm going to tell you that, you know, um, what's really important in Parkinson's disease. And I'm always, I was asked this question today in clinic as to, you know, can you tell me in my lifetime, if we are ever going to be able to find a cure for Parkinson's disease. And, you know, those of uh, you who attended Irene Malati's session and, you know, Michael Oaken's session that there is a very large push, you know, everywhere to figure out ways and means to end uh, Parkinson's disease. 
And to be able to end Parkinson's disease, you know, most importantly, that, you know, are we going to be able to find what causes this? But in spite of the fact that, you know, what would be an ideal goal? As we know, we lose about, you know, 50% of the dopamine producing neurons before patients manifest the, the first cardinal motor symptoms of Parkinson's disease. So let's say that if we were to be find something, who is susceptible? Like who's losing these neurons? And unless you get a DAT scan, you know, nobody's going to know that. And people don't just go get a DAT scan. You know, of course, people who have a family history of Parkinson's may sometimes say, can I get a DAT scan? And I'm not sure that insurance will necessarily pay for it unless there is a reason. So if we are able to find out who's susceptible, who's lost 10% or who's lost 20%, and if we were to be able to find a, um, you know, something, you know, whether it is a genetic therapy or whether it is stem cells or whether it's a medication that would preserve the dopamine containing neurons. And if it's possible that we're able to, you know, make sure that you do not lose the critical mass of dopamine neurons that would manifest symptoms, then we could have a susceptibility for developing Parkinson's disease, but essentially never develop the disease. So that would be basically the goal. And I just wanted to show you, you know, so many different things that people look at. They look at, you know, of course, protein misfolding, inflammation, you know, programmed cell death, um, oxidative high energy stress. Uh, so as I said that, you know, for lack of a neuroprotective agent at this point, I really think that we should all take exercise very seriously. And of course, not everybody can do the same amount of exercise. Do what you can. It's very important. Anybody, you know, somebody with diabetes, somebody with hypertension, somebody with heart disease, you know, what does your cardiologist tell you? Exercise, you know, do, I would say, do 30 minutes of something, try to break a little bit of sweat, you know, you know, make sure you're not falling. You know, if your balance is not good, I would not get on a treadmill. I would go for a walk. I would walk with a walker. I'd walk with a cane. I would walk holding on to, to a friend or a spouse or a partner or, or somebody, but do something. And of course, you know, we are very fortunate in the Dallas-Fort Worth area that we have so many physical therapy groups. We have, you know, um, we have Mike Brayish and we have Dabs and we have, um, you know, lots of rehab places dance with Parkinson's, boxing, any of those things, as long as these are safe for you, that I cannot, you know, belabor how important exercise is, you know, doing some range of motion, lifting some weights, you know, doing some stretching, yoga, tai chi. So there's tons of, you know, things that we can basically do. I'm going to skip some of these, you know, I just want everybody to understand that Parkinson's disease is not just a dopamine story. Dopamine is the main neurochemical that is basically, you know, um, implicated uh, in developing the cardinal motor symptoms, but there are so many different neurochemicals. Some of them control memory, some of them control balance, some of them control, you know, alertness, some of them control cognition, some of them control sleep wave, wake cycle, some of them control mood. And all of these neurochemicals are slowly but surely involved and, you know, sometimes we call these non-motor symptoms. So uh, because, you know, motor symptoms such as tremor or slowness or stiffness uh, because of uh, less dopamine and you replace dopamine and you get better. But then there are non-motor symptoms which come because of the involvement of other neurochemicals. And those can also be, you know, uh, part and parcel of Parkinson's disease. And of course, you know, I'm going to skip the question because obviously uh, this is a question that came out of one of the Michael J. Fox um, you know, foundation web pages and um, essentially which symptoms of Parkinson's disease actually contribute to reducing quality of life. And you could say all of the above, like if, if you don't respond to levodopa or if you have an intractable tremor or you wear off a lot or you have dyskinesias, which are the involuntary movements. But most importantly, you know, when they looked at this, what they found is it is the non-motor symptoms. So whether it is fatigue, mild cognitive impairment, sleep problems, depression, you know, mood and depressions close, say mood disorders can be other things, you know, dementia, low blood pressure, bladder problems, swallowing problems, and so on and so forth. And here I want to put in a plug-in, you know, for 
uh, the Parkinson's Voice Project and you know Samantha Ellendary and her group, uh, along with you know in interest of equipoise LSVT, which is also another you know uh, speech uh, therapy um, organization. So speak out or LSVT, whatever that's closest to your house. It's really important you know in order to be able to do your speech exercises because you need to produce you know you need to be able to preserve your volume so that people can uh, can hear you. And we certainly do not want anybody in our community to develop, you know, what is called aspiration pneumonia. So I want to tell you uh, that, you know, the more that we have learned about Parkinson's disease, that we found that the symptoms may start like decades before the onset of the motor symptoms. And if you look at it, 20 years, like constipation, right? So look at this, it's constipation. I had to put some cartoons in there. This is, you know, REM sleep behavioral disorder. You're acting out their dreams, you're fighting stuff, uh, you know, you're yelling, kicking, and screaming. Uh, this is basically mood disorder, you know, one of them being depression, but apathy is another one. And this is, you know, uh, if you look at the nose, you know, kind of colored it here, that's, this was basically an allergy a cartoon, but I used it here and losing the sense of smell. So a lot of patients, you know, uh, won't tell me, but sometimes, you know, I'll have to ask them and say, How's the sense of smell? And they're like, oh, you know, I haven't had a sense of smell for like 10 years, you know? So these are some pre-motor, you know, symptoms. So for example, you know, and I don't, of course, don't want people to freak out, but if some, let's say you have a family history of Parkinson's disease and you have any of these, um, you know, symptoms, then it would be fair to at least um, try to get an evaluation from a movement disorder doctor if they are able to, you know, pick up some subtle signs uh, on, on exam that would otherwise not be that evident. But again, like I said, I don't have a neuroprotective drug, but we can all exercise uh, just to say again. Okay, so moving on to, you know, seeing a movement disorder specialist. So I'll say this, you know, the who can take care of Parkinson's disease? And the answer is anybody that's a, that's a board eligible or board certified neurologist can take care of people with Parkinson's disease. But a movement disorder specialist, you know, myself being one of them, uh, we go through, you know, I went through two extra years of training doing only movement disorders. I spent another year doing DBS, but pr pretty much doing you know, only movement disorders. So for the two years after my neurology residency, I essentially saw people with movement disorders, of course, tons and tons of, you know, tremors, which is the commonest movement disorder, but tons and tons of Parkinsonism. And so when you see a lot of these patients, you know, it's anything, you, you do more of it, you get better. You see a lot, of a lot of patients, you develop these special skill sets, you have access to, you know, all kinds of information, you have access to clinical trial information, and I think that, you know, having the experience uh, is really important. So I would say that, you know, neurologists with extra training, as I basically said, uh, the knowledge and expertise to provide, you know, really individualized care and holistic care. Um, not everybody with PD sees a movement disorder specialist because there aren't enough of them. And I got to put a plug out here is, you know, I'm a fellowship director for movement disorders and we try to train, you know, we train one or two doctors out of UT Southwestern that are movement disorder specialist every year. But, you know, I wish I could train five of them. If we had the funding to train five of them, I would train five of them. So that is, you know, that is one of the problems. They aren't enough. And sometimes people live, you know, so I, like I said, lack of funding for fellowship training and limited exposure to the specialty during residency holds, you know, doctors from pursuing uh, movement disorder careers. But, you know, if you live far away, if you don't have access to a movement disorder doctor, you know, COVID has taught us that there is something called, you know, virtual uh, visits now. Now, rules may change after COVID. We may not be able to see somebody that's not in our state. You know, I don't know what Medicare rules will be, but right now I was pretty much able to see anybody anywhere that requested a consultation with me. So my suggestion is that if you're not able to see a movement disorder doctor on a regular basis, you know, see your local neurologist, but at least see the movement disorder specialist once a year, you know, twice a year would be ideal, but once a year at least, so they can take a look at your medications, they can take a look at your symptoms, they may be able to identify some subtle symptoms that, that you know, you may be having that you don't know that these are necessarily, you know, related to Parkinson's disease or not. 
And so definitely that. And then I, um, you know, have some resources and I'm more than happy to share a PDF of my presentation and Shelly can email it to you guys that there are some Parkinson's, you know, dot org and the Movement Disorder Society actually has a directory. So you can find, so let's say that, you know, um, if your loved one, friend, somebody lives somewhere where there is, you know, you want to know if there's a movement is our specialist in that area, you can use these resources uh, with, with your zip code and you can find, you know, uh, of course you can always ask me and I'll be happy to tell you, but you can find, you know, people that are trained in movement disorders. So, but we just got some questions that came in. I'm not sure if now is a good time or we can get to them later. Uh, let me take a look. Um, Okay, so I can stop and, and do, you know, uh, Karen, thank you. Very important to see a movement as a specialist. It can save a lot of time and wrong diagnosis. And I agree, I'll tell you, you know, I'll, I get a people saying I have Parkinson's disease, but then I ask them, what are your symptoms? And they'll say, oh, I'm falling all the time. Or I have to self-catheterize myself because I can't pee on my own. These are, you know, <clears throat> really um, red flags. And a person like myself who's, Train in these things, you know, my antenna goes up. I mean, what I'm looking for is these very subtle things that people tell me that make me, you know, make the differentiation between is this Parkinson's disease or is this atypical forms of Parkinsonism, such as, you know, PSP or progressive supranuclear palsy, MSA, multiple system atrophy, you know, and so on and so forth. So I think that it is really important, you know, to be able to uh, make, the, make the right diagnosis and then, <clears throat> What can I do to avoid constipation? Um, well, again, you know, uh, Parkinson's disease makes you susceptible to constipation. Then we put you on levodopa. One of the side effects of levodopa can be constipation. So there is a number of different things. And, you know, this, of course, is like, not all about just constipation management. And we talked about it in the lawn motor thing, but really drinking a lot of fluids, you know, eating a lot of fiber, you know, fruits and vegetables. If you don't move, then your bowels don't move. Of course, you have much more advanced Parkinson's that would be hard, but drinking a lot of fluids is really important. And then somebody will say, well, I need to go to the bathroom more often. And my answer to that is go to the bathroom when you can, not when you have to. And then, you know, suddenly you, ha you have an accident. Um, there's of course medication management, but I really like to use non-medical interventions, you know, first um, before going to, to medical ones. Um, Neck and shoulder pain. Neck and shoulder pain can indicate a lot of different things. It can indicate rigidity or stiffness, but I will tell you that uh, neck and shoulder pain can also be a sign of uh, what is called orthostatic hypotension. That is low blood pressure when you change positions. Hypotension is low blood pressure. Orthostasis is change in position. And those people who have OH, can sometimes have this pain and we call it coat hanger pain because it is exactly like in the area of a coat hanger. And if you treat the low blood pressure, that pain lo and behold goes away. Now, so many patients with Parkinson's disease that have OH go through that, go through medication adjustment. And you know, if you, think, if you give them more levodopa, guess what? It can drop their blood pressure even more and makes the symptoms even worse. So, a movement disorder specialist will be able to think differentially. Is this rigidity or is this, you know, orthostatic hypotension or is this, you know, just musculoskeletal pain, you know, those kinds of things. So that's really important to be able to figure out unless you know what it is, you cannot treat it. Somebody says, um, our sons wonder if they're susceptible to Parkinson's when they get older. Well, age is a risk factor, uh, you know, but really uh, depending on you know, what kind of Parkinson's disease you have that will determine a pattern of inheritance. So for certain uh, genetic forms of Parkinsonism, the pattern of inheritance has been determined. Having said that, you know, <clears throat> I'll give you an example. There is one thing th that is called autosomal dominant. It's a pattern of inheritance where if you have a condition such as, you know, with the genetic mutation with alpha C nuclein, then all your kids have a 50% chance of getting the disease. It doesn't mean that if you have four kids that 50% of them will get, get genetic Parkinsonism. Every kid has a 50% risk. Another pattern of inheritance, every kid has a 25% risk. But the garden variety Parkinson's disease, 
I think, you know, aging is, is the only risk factor. And what can you do if there is a family member with Parkinson's? Uh, I mean, you can certainly be aware of it. So let's say that if you were to develop something like, oh, you know, I have now started acting out my dreams, which is called REM sleep behavioral disorder. It's a stage of sleep where normally most people would be very quiet and limp, but those with, uh, you know, Parkinsonism or um, other neurodegenerative disorders might start acting out their dreams. I sometimes get referrals for, for somebody that has REM sleep behavioral disorder. And the only reason they come to see me is because they want an exam from a movement disorder specialist to find out if there is any subtle, you know, if there are any subtle signs and symptoms. I mean, you know, so, uh, but of course, genetic testing can be done now. It is not, not cheap, but anybody that has a family history of a number of people with Parkinson's disease, you need to talk to your, uh, you know, movement disorder doctor. They need to send you for a genetic consultation and those people will be able to tell you what, you know, what your progeny should basically do. So, you know, strong family history, genetic consult. Um, would genetic testing make a difference? I mean, uh, so I think, you know, long time ago, I would have said no, but today I say yes. And the reason for that is if you have a lot two mutation or if you have a GBA mutation, there are medications now that are being developed that could be LART2 inhibitors, you know, or that could basically enhance the activity of GBA and that could possibly, you know, slow down these disorders. So I think that um, today, 2020, uh, you know, I want to get out of 2020. 2021 answer is uh, genetic testing may make a difference, but you know, you obviously have to have um, a, a strong enough family history to undergo testing. How do you treat early PD? I mean, um, so that's a different, really different topic. And I'm probably going to defer this question at this time because a long answer. But, you know, uh, I mean, in terms of if you have susceptibility, uh, there really isn't that much you can do. You could drink caffeine and you could exercise and you could take good care of yourself is all I'm going to say. I'm assuming that was, you know, Bonnie's question. Um, but as far as the pharmacological or comprehensive management of early PD is really a lecture by itself. Cedar Hill area, there aren't any movement disorders. Cedar Hill is us uh, pretty much. Um, I'm gonna pass this question, I'm gonna move on because I do need to, uh, you know, at least, and then I'll come back again. So these are some movement disorder doctors, Dr. Farn, Dr. Jankovic, Dr. Kamala, you know, Dr. Oaken, we saw Dr. Dewey and certainly myself, and we can all help you. So I want to talk a bit about how do you prepare for your movement disorder doctor visit? I got to tell you this. <clears throat> I'm at UT Southwestern. Um, we get one hour, 60, that is 60 minutes for a new patient consultation, and we get 30 minutes for a um, follow-up, um, you know, follow-up visit, okay? Private practice, it's maybe 50% of that. You probably get 20, 20 minutes, sometimes 15 minutes to see a general neurologist for a follow-up and you may get 40, 40 minutes, 30 to 45 minutes to see a new patient. Uh, I've been doing this for 20 years. I'm by no uh, means uh, slow. I'm, in fact, I'm quick, I'm fast, I can type really fast. Um, I try not to talk very fast, but the thing is that I cannot nearly get all the information from you in a 60 minute visit, leave alone a 30 or 45 minute visit. So when I see somebody for the, although I do have a distinct advantage that I have fellows. So my fellow will go and spend an hour and then I'll come in and spend another half an hour. And your total visit is you, you getting 90 min, you know, uh, minutes out of us. But essentially, you know, time is short. This is all dictated by reimbursement. If you want to get, you know, it's not like we, we want to rush you or we don't want to spend time with you. It is all dictated by reimbursement. You know, everybody needs to make a certain amount. We all have our target, you know, our views. So time is still short. If you want to make your visit really efficient for you, then, you know, bring along an extra set of ears. You know, I can't imagine that I can remember everything bring a person that's close to you, bring a friend, bring a spouse would be better, bring a child would be better. You know, before you come to your visit, write down 
what do you want to talk about and i i usually ask people you know tell me one two three what are the things you want to talk about and you could have four five six seven eight and and you know uh, at which point i'll say i'll either set you up for another visit or i'll have my pa talk to you but if you write your symptoms if you write down everything that's happened to you since the last time you saw me okay um you can either make a list of your medications but i really need very specific details people will say i take a yellow pill i take a blue pill and you know i'll tell you very honestly because i've been doing this for a long time i can actually i actually know what a yellow pill is and a blue pill is and a white pill is but not everybody knows that so write it down when i take cinemat 25 slash 100 it's an immediate release because yellow is immediate release or your bottle will say er extended release or cr control release okay otherwise just bring your medication bottles don't bring all your meds but definitely you know first visit i almost encourage people to just either bring a very comprehensive list or just bring me your whole bag and my fellow will sort through everything but you know you can feel free to bring your parkinson's medicine bottle so that i can take a look at it i don't want to refill a wrong prescription right so that's really uh, you know important if you have any films like you've done imaging you've done mris or you've done dat scan bring me the films every neurologist worth their salt should look at a dat scan should look at an mri should look at a ct scan themselves you know it's not like we don't trust anybody but we just don't trust anybody we have to trust our own eyes and you know i don't want to write anything in a note saying mri brain was normal and then i look at the mri and i'm like oh wait did you have a stroke like i'm looking at this mri and you had a small stroke but you didn't know right so it is very important for me to be able to see your um you know your imaging studies and then write your list of questions you know the thing that becomes really hard for me is we finished the visit it's 35 minutes i've already gone 5 minutes over time and people say oh i have one more question and i have one more question and you know i just don't have the personality to cut people off and say i can't talk to you anymore and that's why i end up being late you know if you write your list of questions think about them thoughtfully now you may occasionally forget one or two questions but write your list of questions so i know what's priority for you what needs to be addressed at this visit and and you know that's really important and then if you're coming in for a initial visit you know be prepared for a somewhat long day sometimes i'll have my uh, you know coordinator do some video recording sometimes i'll say you know you're off medicine right now why don't we give you you know a dose of levodopa uh, with with a full glass of water and why don't we basically you know make you sit outside for an hour wait for your medicine to kick in so that i'm able to see you know what kind of a benefit that you basically derive with medications so these things are you know really really important and what is the last thing i'm trying to say um and here's another very important tip as in any relationship you know you're all smart people you're going to get a sense for when you meet the doctor whether you know this is like you know i'm i'm joking but it's like your first date you know whether you want to go on a second date or not you know you see a doctor you know see how their bedside manner is see you know do they answer your questions do they take you seriously and you know if i don't have time to answer the questions i'll say um i'm really running late i don't have time to answer these questions send me a my chart message or guess what i will set you up with a follow up with you know my pa so that i can make sure you know having a physician extender really helps me because that way i can basically make sure that your questions are answered by either myself or another member of my team sometimes i will have my nurse call you and say you know these people had a couple of questions i couldn't answer them why don't you call them and answer them you know who we'll make sure that we address your concerns but you know do recognize that we are also on a timetable and you know we need um we need good information and then these again i'll i'll be happy to share the pdf uh, these are some websites that i think are legitimate websites you know don't just talk to google okay these are legitimate websites michael j fox legitimate information david stinney you know some of these other websites they are really good and those are the things you can you know uh, go read you can read about research you know um one of my my big jobs is basically uh this avowing people of their misperceptions of the disease on whatever they picked up on dr google you know so look for legitimate information uh and you know we'll, we'll 
So essentially, that's important. And you know, ask your doctor if you have any any doubt. You know, ask your doctor. Of course, you know, I do understand that time is limited, but I can tell you that's why having a PA. But the PA can just set up a visit with you to answer your questions. Nothing else. Don't have to do an exam. Don't have to go through medications. Answer your question for thirty minutes, and that will be helpful. And you got to understand this is really important. And I'm making light of it, but it's really you know. Uh, do not confuse your Google search with my medical degree. We go through tons and tons of education to get there right. Ask, ask me, ask my team. We'll be able to answer your questions. And you know, no question is a stupid question. I'll say in all humility, you know, there isn't anything like a stupid question. It's your question. You know, we don't want to make light of it. We definitely want to answer it. You know, in terms of tests, what kinds of tests? You know, a lot of times I don't need a, need a test because the diagnosis of Parkinson's disease, even in 2021. is going to be made on the basis of history and physical exam uh, you know sometimes i will get a brain mri in people that have hypertension or diabetes to make sure there's no stroke you know a lot of times also always want to make sure you know that you know how much brain atrophy the patient has atrophy as a loss of brain tissue sometimes you know i've occasionally very rarely but i had a patient that we diagnosed with parkinson's disease looked very much like parkinson's disease responded to parkinson's medication ended up having a brain tumor this happens very rarely so please don't freak out um you know uh, it doesn't diagnose parkinson's disease but it will diagnose this this is a brain tumor this is a condition called normal pressure hydrocephalus or nph remember this mri brain you know a lot of times patients will say oh, i went to see a neurologist i got a brain mri and they diagnosed me with parkinson's and i say what did they find on your brain mri that told them that this is parkinson's we are not there yet you know i think imaging is going to get to a point where we might be able to find some subtle findings but we're not there yet but we don't want to miss a brain tumor we don't want to miss normal pressure hydrocephalus excess fluid on the brain interferes with walk walking can cause cognitive problems can cause urinary problems can be reversed with a shunt in some patients okay this is somebody that has had uncontrolled diabetes hypertension that has you know lots of the brain tissue has melted and you're seeing this fluid and but that can basically cause people to have problems with walking and their walking can resembling resemble a parkinsonian shuffling gait these other things that i'm showing you are findings that you know you, we might be able to pick in somebody that has an atypical form of parkinsonism so for example i'm just going to show this this person here has lost a lot of their cerebellum and that's why they have balance issues they've lost a significant part of a part of the brain called the pons and you know we we you know neurologists have all these uh, acronyms and all of these things that they name things with so this particular thing here is called the hot cross cross bun sign and that's something that can be seen one of the conditions is msa any typical form of parkinsonism so when i order a brain mri i'm not diagnosing parkinsons i'm looking for these you know secondary parkinsons and i'm looking for atypical features you know and then this is a dat scan so dat scan is basically da for dopamine t for uh, you know transporter um you 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 get a, a radioactive compound it binds to the dopamine transporter uh, in a normal person without parkinsons disease this is what it looks like the uptake of the radioactive compound you know when it's complete it looks like a comma when you have lost this tail um and you've lost some dopamine neurons then it looks like a full stop so you know by the time you are symptomatic even if you're symptomatic on one side you know you might be able to see uh, that you know you're symptomatic on one side but you still may have lost the uh you know the dopamine containing neurons on on the other side as well so you know do I, do i get that scan in everybody not really if the diagnosis is pretty you know pretty certain based on my history and physical exam i don't need it um really that scan was invented to uh, you know for people that had another condition called essential tremor and if they had a subtle tremor that i felt had a resting tremor you know essential tremor is a postural tremor is a action is a kinetic tremor parkinsonian tremor is a tremor at rest so if i see subtle parkinsonian features then i might get a dat scan to differentiate so that i can start treating them okay so 
No, I'm going to go for another 10 minutes and then we'll break, you know, for questions and then we'll do, you know, we'll do another session to talk about, you know, everything else that I wanted to, to tell you guys. Know your medications. Make a very detailed list, you know, all medicines, but definitely separate PD from non-PD medicines. I like to see supplements. I like to see what people are taking. You know, there is a person here. Uh, I, I think she's at, um, I forget, she's a pharmacist. Her name, her name is Amy Blasek. And she basically always talks about, you know, supplements. Like, you know, we don't know, you know, people will occasionally send me a, a name of a, a, a supplement and say, can I take this? You know, I, I saw this on Google that this was good for, you know, for improving my brain or improving, you know, dopamine. And none of these supplements have been studied in conjunction with Parkinson's medicine. I'm not trying to be an obstructionist. You know, if, if, if something was useful, trust me, I'm going to give it to you. Okay. If I tell you, Dr. Dewey tells you, uh, you know, that don't take it, then there is a reason for it. We also don't know what kind of drug interactions happen with these supplements, what kind of side effects you can have. You know, it can sometimes be very dangerous. It's good if you could know both the generic and the brand name. So brand name is Cinnamon. Uh, generic name is Levodopa Carbidopa. Brand name is Riteri. Generic name is Levodopa Carbidopa. Brand name is Parcopa. Generic name is still Levodopa Carbidopa. Okay, Levodopa Carbidopa comes in many different, you know, formulations. And uh, know the exact strength of the medicine. It's important for me to know. Are you taking 25 slash 100? Are you taking 50 slash 200? What are you taking? How do I refill your prescription, right? Especially if you're a new patient. And then I, we really, you know, uh, Parkinson's doctors are very obsessive about the how much you take, when do you take, how many times a day do you take, you know, this is really important. And I'll tell you why. Because somebody says, you know, oh, around six o'clock in the evening, I suddenly just can't function. You know, I can't move, my legs don't move, you know, and I'm like, what was your last dose of medicine? So let's say that you were taking your medicines two times a day, eight o'clock in the morning and 8 p.m., your ATM medicine has, you know, even in early disease has definitely worn off by the time you reach 8 p.m. And, and, you know, no wonder you're slow and stiff. You know, when I want to know what is the strength of the medicine, it helps me understand how good can you get, you know? Um, and I want to know, did you get 10% better? Did you get 50% better? Did you get 80% better? Because if you got only 10% better, then there is a lot of room for adjustment. If you got 70, 80% better, I'm going to say, you know, this is probably very good. If you want to go a quarter tablet high on the levodopa and see if it gets you even better, but you know, this is very good. But if you're 40% better, I want to get you 70% or 80% better, right? So then I want to give you a higher dose of the medicine. If your medicine is not lasting, if you're eight, you take your medicine at eight, your next dose is at, you know, a one, but by 12 o'clock, you're shuffling, you're slow, you're, uh, you know, shaking, obviously you're wearing off, right? So I need to know, you know, can I move the medication from one o'clock to 12 o'clock so that I'm able to give you a smooth amount of levodopa in your body. One of the important things that everybody with Parkinson's disease has to remember, we need to have continuous dopamine stimulation to your brain. We don't want peaks and troughs. We don't want you to kick in kick out, kick in, kick out. We want you to kick in, stay kicked in. And, that, and that's why in some patients, especially later in the course of the disease, we will also give you a control release or extended release formulation at bedtime, or even sometimes in the middle of the night so that we can keep you know, dopamine in your brain at all times. And then you know, write down any side effects. And it is very important. Don't ever walk away from a doc new doctor's office without asking them, these important questions. Why are you giving me this medicine? What are other options for me? Um, what do I expect in terms of improvement? What do I expect in terms of side effects? Now, if you are you know, like me and you're an academic and a movement is or a doctor, I will tell you this without you asking me. But if I don't tell you, you know, even I'm not about the law. Ask me that question. You know, Dr. Janus, you didn't tell me about the side effects of this new medicine. You know, I stand corrected. I will tell you the side effects. It's very important to know what are you taking? What your options are? Why did your doctor pick this specific medicine? Why not something else that's available? You know, uh, what is the strength? How to take it? Why to take it? I want to do one thing. 
uh, you know, um, I want to say one thing that I really want to, um, you know, so I'm talking about, this is going to be my last, uh, uh, you know, uh, a couple of slides for talking. People always say, nobody ever told me how to take my medicine. And, you know, I'll pull up the note, every single note from 2007 that I have been here, every time I wrote the exact instructions, copied and pasted and gave them to you. We have electronic medical record system. And, you know, so this is, these couple of slides are the most important slides for today. Okay, understanding how levodopa works. What is levodopa? Levodopa is dopamine. It's L-dopa, L-isomer. It's a chemical, uh, you know, uh, a formulation of dopamine. Dopamine cannot go from the gut to the blood to, and it cannot go to the brain. Dopamine does not dissolve in the fat membranes of the brain. What you need is a fat soluble form of dopamine, which is L-dopa or levodopa, okay? Now, if we only got levodopa, what would happen is basically there is an enzyme that will basically, you know, break down levodopa in the gut or in the bloodstream, and you will either get not enough or no uh, levodopa going into the brain. And that's why God invented, or God or whoever else the universe invented, carbidopa. Carbidopa will, um, you know, block an enzyme that prevents the breakdown of levodopa in the periphery, whether it's the gut or blood, so that enough can go into the brain. You know, you are missing dopamine in your brain. It needs to go into the brain. It doesn't need to be stuck in the gut or in blood, okay? So this is a gastrointestinal tract. This is your mouth. This is your esophagus. This is your stomach, this bag. Uh, and you know, that's why when you eat a lot and keep eating a lot, it expands, okay? So uh, this is um, the small intestine. And this is like feet and feet and feet. These are folded, but these are many, many feet, okay? This is the part of the small intestine, which is the early part where, uh, you know, levodopa, carbidopa is basically absorbed, okay? And then it goes into, this is the large intestine, and then from the large intestine, you know, colon, this is rectum and anus, which is where stool uh, passes from. At which point my 17 year old would have said EU. But you know, as a Parkinson's doctor and as a Parkinson's patient, we can be shy uh, to talk about these things because it's very important. Now let's watch this, okay? This is you, you're taking your medicine. Take it always on time, okay? Take it with a full glass of water. Why full glass of water? Patients will say, oh, I don't like to drink water. Oh, I'm gonna to go to the bathroom, okay? Everything in Parkinson's disease is slow. Transit through the gut is slow. You have to be able to force that pill to be able to go from here all the way to here. That's a lot of distance to basically travel. If you don't push it, it's gonna come on slowly. And then patients will tell me, how long does it take for your levodopa to work? Oh, one hour, one hour. That means you one hour of off time, right? We don't want that. We want it to kick in in, you know, 20 minutes, maybe 30 minutes max, but you know, 15 to 20 minutes, it should kick in so that, you know, you have a fast on response. You, when you drink a glass of water, it forces the medicine to go all the way and come here quickly. And, you know, now empty stomach. Why empty stomach? There is nothing there to block the medicine, you know, from going where it eventually needs to go, okay? This is where it's absorbed. It goes into the blood, this is the blood vessel. So from the gut, it goes into the bloodstream and then it goes into the brain, okay? Where it really needs to go. This is how it needs to be. Empty stomach, full glass of water, you know, don't have any constipation and, and you know, make sure that you balance your meals and, and the pill, you know, not meals just with protein, but all meals, but proteins, you know, especially. Now, why levodopa does not work, okay? Look at this. Oops, what happened? I'm sorry, I went back. Okay, so this is you taking your medicine. <coughs> you didn't take it with a full glass of water, it's just stuck there. You're waiting to turn on, you're not turning on because the medicine's not going where it needs to go, right? On top of that, you know, your wife decided that she was gonna feed you some steak. And so what happens to the, to the pill? It's just stuck here, right? It's not advancing. 
by any luck, if it manages to get to the intestine, you know, at the level of the intestine, there are these transporters. These transporters will cause this medicine to go into the bloodstream and then into the brain. If there is a lot of protein sitting here, you know, protein is broken down into these very simple blocks that are called amino acids. Levodopa is broken down into amino acids. It's, a, it's an amino acid. So when you have a lot of food and a little bit of levodopa in competition with each other, guess who wins? Food wins, levodopa doesn't get absorbed or enough doesn't get absorbed. Very little goes into the bloodstream, very little goes into the brain, guess what happens? You're slow, you're stiff, you're shaking. And there is logic, you know, there is logic behind how these things basically work. Now, I will say that there is always an exception to the rule. I have some patients who will say, my levodopa only works best when I take it with food. I rest my case. In those patients, you know, I'm gonna say, do whatever you want, as long as it kicks in very quickly, as long as you're getting a full bang for the buck, as long as it's lasting into the next dose, you know, uh, there's always an exception. But for most people, this is the logic. And we have to make, you know, and people will come and say, can you increase my medicine? And I say, why? And they were like, well, because my medicine doesn't work. And then I go through all of these questions, right? And then, okay. So having said that, uh, I am gonna now, I mean, let me look at the chat box. My freezing has gotten a lot worse these past few weeks. Is there anything, supplements or medicine that can alleviate or reduce freezing episodes? The tips I have no longer work and the neurologist said, there are no meds. Okay. There are two kinds of freezing of gait. One freezing of gait is levodopa responsive, which means that you've got to make sure that you are not wearing off because if you wear off and then you take your medicine, then you unfreeze or defrost, whatever you call it, right? That is levodopa responsive freezing of gait. But there is a second kind of freezing of gait that is not levodopa responsive the neurochemical there is not dopamine. It possibly could be acetylcholine. And Dr. Dower, you know, Bill Dower, our Brain Institute director, had talked about this at one of the Parkinson's Voice Project thing is that, you know, um, there is levodopa non-responsive freezing of gait. What do you do for those? We've tried different medicines. We've tried Ritalin. We have tried, you know, uh, some of the cognitive enhancing medicines, uh, Exelon, Aricept. Uh, we've tried, you know, another medicine called Droxidopa. They work in some people, but they may not necessarily consistently work in all. DBS does not help levodopa unresponsive freezing of gait, uh, physical therapy, you know, make sure you don't wear off. But, you know, um, if that's not the case, I think physical therapy is, is really, you know, the, the important thing. Is Gokovri the only extended release of antidine? It's expensive and unaffordable. Uh, there are there are two forms of extended release uh, mantidine. One's called Gokovabri. The other one is called Osmolex. Uh, I think they are both expensive. Uh, the insurance company always gives a, us a hard time saying, "Have you used the you know immediate release of mantidine?" Um, but but you know if if I say I've used the immediate release of mantidine, it doesn't uh, you know really um, kind of um, work, and I can make a case with insurance sometimes. Then insurance may approve. But I agree, again, I mean, my personal experience has not been, you know, huge in terms of Gokovri and Osmolex. I think my partners will also agree. If you read the clinical trials data, they say that people have gotten up to four hours of on time with Gokovri. Um, I'm not sure I've managed to replicate that. They, they may get some on time. The goal of, you know, extended release of antidine is to try to give you, you know, a little more on time without having dyskinesias. You know, dyskinesias are the involuntary movements that happen in people uh, as their Parkinson's disease advances and as they have taken, you know, levodopa for a longer period of time. Uh, insurance companies don't get me started. My husband has a tremor in his head when he watches TV or focuses on his laptop. Should he be checked out by a neurologist? Um, okay, so head tremor, like isolated head tremor by itself is not a sign of Parkinson's disease. Head or neck tremor can be essential tremor, can be another kind of tremor that's called dystonic tremor. Or some people can have this head banging or uh, you know that's involuntary movements, that's head dyskinesia, different from head tremor. Head tremor is not a characteristic sign of Parkinson's disease. Does having uh, 
PD make you more susceptible to other cross? What is other what? C R O S. Chronic diseases. Okay. Ah. Uh, no, not really. I mean, people with Parkinson's disease can develop mood disorders. Uh, can develop anxiety that are part and parcel of that. Uh, you know, can certainly develop. You know. Um, dementia that has non-motor symptoms, but they are part and parcel, you know, basically uh, of of um, you know of basically part. It, it 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 isn't like diabetes or hypertension makes you susceptible to having heart attacks or strokes. Having Parkinson's disease, you know, does it make you more susceptible to other chronic illnesses? Um, you know, I mean, unless there is a genetic form of Parkinsonism that can, you know, maybe give you something else, like like I said, Cauchy's disease. And Parkinson's or Gaucher's disease and dementia with Lewy bodies can can coexist, but Parkinson's by itself, you know, um, these are all the disorders that are part and parcel of what goes with Parkinson's. So my husband gets nauseated when he takes his medicine on an empty stomach. He takes levodopa, carbidopa, azelaic, and amantadine. Which of the drugs may be the culprit? So technically, a short answer is all of the above. Long, you know, um, long answer is. Um, Levodopa, carbidopa probably is the most important culprit. Uh, it can cause a significant amount of nausea. In those patients, I tell people, take it with non-protein foods, like small quantities. Take crackers or take fruit or, you know, worst come to worst scenario. I mean, you can uh, drink ginger, excuse me, ginger ale, chew on ginger candy. Ginger is good for nausea. But there is also a medicine called Tigan, uh, which is, you know, don't take Zofran. Don't take all the chemotherapy medicines. Certainly don't take Phenergan and Compazine. Phenergan and Compazine are two anti-nausea medicines that block dopamine. That's going to make your Parkinson's disease worse. Tigan is the medicine to take if you have levodopa-induced nausea. But you can certainly you know, try like ginger ale, ginger candy, taking with, with crackers and, and so on and so forth. You mentioned drinking caffeine. How much do you recommend? Does it help somebody already has Parkinson's? No, uh, it does not help. Once you have Parkinson's disease, uh, drinking a lot of caffeine will not slow down the course of the disease. I don't know that there is answer to how much caffeine I drink. I drink too much caffeine. When I was in grad school, I ended up in the ICU because I had uh, you know, heart rhythm problems because of drinking too much caffeine. Uh, also, it depends if you drink caffeine with a lot of sugar and cream. I drink my coffee with sugar, and so I only drink two, two cups. So I basically end up about three or four teaspoons of sugar, which is some people may say that's even too much. So there is no, you know, how much, but if you drink a lot of caffeine, you know, you, it can certainly put you at risk of developing some heart rhythm disturbances. So, you know, uh, maybe a cup in the morning, cup in the afternoon. I mean, I don't know, three cups probably are safe for me. What is your recommendation for taking the COVID vaccine? Okay, um, I think that, you know, uh, I think short answer is we should take it. Long answer is that if you have uh, immune disorders, if you're pregnant or if you have immune mediated disorders, definitely talk to your OBGYN, definitely talk to your, you know, whoever, whoever is your immune doctor. I'll tell you, uh, you know, I have rheumatoid arthritis, I'm on an immune suppressive medication. You know, I was gonna call my ID doctor, but you know, the, I'm gonna take it. Um, it has not been tested in clinical trials in pregnant women or, in, or with patients with chronic, uh, with immune disorders. But I think that my likelihood of, you know, developing Corona and dying is much higher than developing something else. Having said that, uh, whatever chronic condition you have, talk to your doctor, they'll be able to give you the best advice. Uh, can you talk about brain fog? Sure. <laughs> brain fog can mean many different things. Most of the times when patients tell me that they have brain fog, it means they are running out of dopamine. Um, as you, you know, when you run out of dopamine, you can have motor symptoms such as tremor stiffness and slowness, but you can also have non-motor symptoms. People develop drenching sweats as a non-motor symptom. People develop a lot of anxiety as a non-motor symptom at the end of dose. People develop a low mood at the end of dose. People develop a cognitive or a brain fog at the end of dopamine because they, dopamine does many different things besides motor symptoms. So, you know, 
uh, when you give somebody dopamine, their drenching sweat, sweats miraculously disappear, their anxiety gets better, their mood gets better, and the brain fog gets better. So most of the times, you know, now sometimes is there a thing such as too much dopamine? And there is. There are people that will take, you know, they, they may have, uh, they, they don't want to wear off. Uh, they don't like the way they feel when they wear off and they'll be popping more medicines before their time. There is that anticipatory anxiety of wearing off, which makes patients with Parkinson's disease, you know, um, take more medicine. You know, in certain communities, when I was in Louisiana, the patients used to call levodopa PD, PD crack. You know, people just popped it. There is a condition called dopamine dysregulation syndrome, and that is that can happen. Uh, taking the dopamine can stimulate some reward and reinforcement centers that will want you to crave more and more and more, um, you know, levodopa. So you really have to be very careful. I always tell family members to watch people, you know, the dopamine agonists are the medications that probably put you at a higher risk for impulse control disorders, but levodopa can do that as well. Um, best treatment options for wearing off of levodopa. So simple thing, make your levodopa work for yourself. Take it on an empty stomach, full glass of water, don't have constipation, absorb all the levodopa that you can. Your IR cinnamon, you know, if you take 100 milligrams, ideally you should be able to absorb 90 milligrams. There is this thing that's called bioavailability. So 100 milligrams of levodopa should get you 90 milligrams of levodopa into your brain. But if you don't take it the right way, you could get anywhere from zero to, you know, to whatever, and then you're not doing well. So the simple thing is, you know, taking it on time, taking it the right way, making sure each dose of levodopa eases into the next one. If those things are addressed, there are medications for wearing off. You know, you can use medicines such as MAOB inhibitors, that's Azelec can be used for wearing off. There are many new medicines now. There is a formulation of levodopa that's called Imbrija, which is the inhaler that's approved for wearing off. Uh, Kinmobi or sublingual apomorphine is approved for wearing off. Uh, injectable subcutaneous apomorphine is approved for wearing off. There is another medicine called Nurians that works by a different mechanism, is approved for wearing off. People, some people take Stelevo, which is levodopa, carbidopa, and entacapone, which is you know inhibitor of another enzyme called COMT. Those are approved for wearing off. But also, you know, dopa, levodopa, carbidopa, intestinal pump, and then of course, last but not the least. Deep brain stimulation can also help with wearing off. When I started taking levodopa, carbidopa, I was taking it three times a day. Now, three years later, I take five, five meds per day. Will I have to take the medicine more and more often as time goes? Um, short answer is yes, it's possible. Uh, there are people who take levodopa, carbidopa five, six, seven times uh, a day. Um, but really, you know, once my patients go from every four, any lower than every four hour frequency, I start talking to them about deep brain stimulation. You know, I don't want a large dopamine load. A large dopamine load, you know, again, it's different for different people. For some person, 500 milligrams of levodopa may be too much. For some people, 2000 milligrams of levodopa may not be too much. So it, it just basically depends. More levodopa you take, you know, the more constipated you can be, the more it can drop your blood pressure, the more nauseous it can be, the more it can put you at risk of developing hallucinations. So once my patients go below less than like four hours, I mean, of course, I will try the adjunct add-on therapies to be able to get more on time. I'll try those medications. But then in my brain, I'm starting to think about, you know, will this person be a good candidate for advanced therapies? You know, and by the way, DBS is not an advanced therapy. DBS is now approved for patients with Parkinson's disease who've had the diagnosis for four years. It's FDA approved for early DBS. Uh, you and your physician can work together to figure out when is the right window of time to do DBS. So your question, Linda, is yes, it's possible that, you know, what happens is, okay, this is what happens. In early disease, when you take levodopa, carbidopa, your brain still has some dopamine terminals that will store that levodopa and release it in what is called a physiological manner. So storage happens and it gets released. Once you have advanced disease and you don't have enough dopamine terminals, then what happens is your body now relies on not endogenous, but exogenous 
uh, administration of levodopa so that you know and that is why you have to take more and more and more because as the disease advances there is no brain storage yes i will add parkinson's voice project to the list of helpful websites yes absolutely i did mention it you know in my early part of my lecture but i will be happy to basically do that and i think shelly had answered pretty much let me see if there is one question remaining that i can answer um but i think i answered all of the questions so um i hope this was helpful you know i think this is the tip of the iceberg parkinson's disease is a very you know comprehensive complicated disorder uh, the reason we're doing this uh, so i i hope this was helpful uh, you know um i'll be happy to send you the pdf i'll i'll do the uh, part 2 in january and then i'll send the pdf and shelly can just email it to you guys and you can keep it you know uh, feel free to distribute uh, not a problem again thanks guys i mean the reason that we do what we do is because of you guys you know you make us better you know you have to make your doctor accountable if you want your doctor to be uh, to be good for you then you have to work by directionally and and you know you have to help your doctor take better care of you and that is really the point of my uh, you know my um my talk and the the next talk that we will do um next time thank you shilpa such great information thank you everyone for joining i know that our patients loved it. If you are a person with PD or a medical professional or a caregiver with a specific unmet need, please let us know as we plan for 2021. That'll be greatly helpful um, in helping us serve you in the best way possible. Just got a question in my uh, private chat if we're continuing these in 20, uh, 2021 and she said, please don't stop. So we have no intention of stopping, absolutely will be continuing these in 2021. So if you're subscribed to SkyPass Foundation, you will get uh, notifications of our upcoming webinars. And with that, we will wrap it up. Thank you again, Shilpa. Thank you again, everyone for joining. Have a safe Guys, and happy holiday season. Safe. We will see Take you. Take the vaccine, call your doctor. <laughs> Absolutely. And we'll see you guys in 2021. Have a good night.